thought we could have a, a discussion about them and I'll blast through the slides and the slides are um, more of a um, fuel for the fire so to speak so um, so bear with the slides and start thinking and digging and remembering the things that you've seen as you've uh, gone through school and gone through your career paths or whatever and then when we get through uh, we'll just have a conversation about the, the different uh, the different things so um, my name is uh, Jeff Fitzmorris and this is actually my second year being uh, an ambassador for the Fedora project and it's my second year being uh, manning the booth by myself and being in charge of that um, in my day job, I work for a local airplane manufacturing company, and I also uh, dabble around in mechanics, and I like to play with my lawnmowers, and I like to do a little bit of construction. I'm building a house this fall that I get to live in for the rest of my adult life. Um, I have a bachelor's in science in information systems and security, which doesn't mean anything because I'm not using it right now, I'm just building wings. So, um, so I'm not gonna take that and thump people's heads with it. It's, you know, it doesn't mean anything, except that I reached a milestone, I got my bachelor's and I'm free. So, <laughs> um, just a little shameless plug for the different anniversaries we have going on. The Fedora project is 15 years old uh, Linux is 25, and I think Linux Fest is 20, is that right? Okay, good. So, and a big shout out to everybody responsible for making all this stuff happen. And I, I'm coming in late in the game. I started in Linux back in 2009, so that's still kind of late. Um, but I've been around for about 10 years, so. Um, ideas shape the future. Um, and that sounds like a little cliche. Have you ever heard that as a cliche before? Ideas just don't happen by themselves, but people have ideas and shape the future by building on those ideas. It's really called scientific method. It starts with the scientific method. You guys, A lot of people don't even remember that from high school or college or anything like that. I mean, do we still use that today? I mean, is that still taught in college, the scientific method? You make an observation, you ask a question, you form a hypothesis or a testable explanation, make a prediction based on the hypothesis, test the prediction, uh, use the results to make a new hypothesis or a prediction and when that stops what happens when we reach the end of that peer review. what's that peer review. peer review now which is is that relatively new in the last 10 years or is that something that's been going on for a while so so some of the guys that we're going to talk about today they had peer review because they were involved in associations and um, financiers and people who just undergirded their whole entire experiments, their peer review was the people paying the money. And if the money stopped, your uh, scientific peer review didn't really matter. So, um, the people of history who made breakthrough discoveries, eureka moments, started with a foundational idea, an observation. And many, many of those guys, if not all of them, sacrifice a great deal proving their ideas. So, um, this is just an example. The, the pictures up here. I mean, we have we're in outer space again. Uh, the the second slot. The second picture is a. a just one example, automatic, um, what do they call those things, AVGs? Uh, automated guided vehicles, which we have in our company and they move all of our heavy stuff around. Uh, and then uh, 
Then the thing on the bottom right hand corner is just a idea starter for artificial intelligence, which uh, in 2016, it wasn't really on the front page, but 2017, it's really, really, really hot, and they're trying to develop that. Um, how the AVGs work, I think it's really interesting is we think that they're automatic, but they're, they're automatic in the sense that somebody has to go build a floor grid for them, and they have to set nodes and so you got an operator that kind of programs all those things in for the AVG and uh, pushes the green go button and it follows that track from node to node to node to node so it drives over here picks up a heavy object drives over here drops it off drives over here and parks and rests and then you plug in we still have to plug these in so they're not artificial intelligence yet they'd like to think that we are but we're not. Um, so the, the notable uh, people of the past who pioneered, who pioneered the tech that we have today, um, you guys recognize any of those names up there? I mean, Hertz, Maxwell I didn't recognize right away, Marconi, everyone's heard of Marconi, and Hughes, does anybody have satellite internet? HughesNet. Hughes I'm not sure if that's related, but it might be. Why is it 1864 Maxwell? Oh, that's uh, a typo. Oh, okay. I thought there was more than one Maxwell. <laughs> Maxwell House Coffee. No. <laughs> um, Bose. Some of us have Bose uh, headsets, Bose stereos. Um, I threw Caveman in there because he started fire and built the wheel and all that. Um, uh, Tesla, Pascal, Leib, uh, how do you pronounce that, Leibniz, uh, Kleist, have you heard of these guys? Anyone that you haven't heard of? Who's, yeah, I can't pronounce that. Who, uh, I think it's the last one. Uh, uh, or something like that, oh, I'm not sure. And Lesage. I don't know if I actually highlighted uh, Musenbrook. Uh, but all the other ones I did, I didn't highlight Caveman because that's kind of a no-brainer. Um, but, you know, these are the ones that we'll just survey through and just to kind of spark some stuff going on in mine. Uh, Wilhelm, Wilhelm Schickard. How do you pronounce that? Schickard? Schickard? Um... I thought this was interesting because this is one of the first, you know, computers or calculators that ever that was developed. And he's probably not isolated. It's just something that pops up in history. Um, this machine could add and subtract six digit numbers. And while just being a, a clockwork style machine, it worked. Looks like something from King Tut's tomb. And it really does. It looks like, you know, there looks like there might be a sarcophagus built in there somewhere. Um, Blaise Pascal designed what was coined the Pascaline. It was such a success, it actually failed. Um, but the accountants of the day were afraid they were going to lose their jobs because this worked so well. And, but you know what? If you ever use an abacus, I, I'm sure these would uh, defeat an abacus like that. So, scale up. This is an interesting invention that kind of caught my eye because you only <coughs> see these things on uh, TV shows, you know, like the, the guy who's, you know, stranded with no power, Gilligan's Island, let's make uh, some battery out of a coconut. Um, E.G. von Kleist invented the Leyden jar. This predates the capacitors and batteries. And then fast forward to the future, this invention was foundational to what we see in our cell phones, notebooks, tablets, and even our hybrid cars. All electric storage technology has its foundation in this Leyden jar. Um, 
And I looked it up on YouTube last night. I don't know what time it was. But they actually have a tutorial on how you can actually build one of these. And it's, it's, it's salt water, aluminum foil, some wires, and a plastic cup. <laughs> and, it's, and it can actually store energy to where you know, notable measurable energy. So that's interesting. Um, Lesage, who's, has anybody heard of Lesage? He patented the electrostatic telegraph in 1774. Um, what's interesting about all these is that all the technology that you see right now, these, all these guys are the foundation for what we have. Um, so he patented the, the electrostatic telegraph, but it doesn't mean that he, you know, uh, built the network of telegraph wires or poles or stations. These didn't magically pop up in 1774. Um, he, he, was just, he just created a working model and had it patented. Um, Maxwell's electromagnetic theory fundamentally changed the course of physics as they knew it then. He piggybacked on his research on Michael Faraday, you know, the Faraday cage, William Thompson, Carl Gauss. Um, even though he may not have, uh, we're not talking about any of his physical experiments, we're just talking about his theory was transformational to science back in the day. Um, Thomas Edison, um, we have a, we owe a lot of our stuff, the things that we have to Thomas a Edison. Um, one thing that I noticed when I was, you know, looking into this was that wireless technology was first conceived of back in the 1800s. And we're still perfecting wireless technology today, which is, you know, several hundred years, a couple hundred years afterwards. Um, various people tested various hypotheses, which led them down similar and different paths. Paths like radio, television, mobile phones, Bluetooth, and Wi-Fi, etc. And the, the thing that we have right there, and there's modern versions of this that actually do much more than this thing did. Um, that's Edison's uh, Theroscope. Is it? <clears throat> Um, Edison coined the term etheric force. Um, etheric force is a term uh, that describes a phenomenon uh, as, let's see, how, do, how does that go? Etheric force is a term Thomas Edison coined to describe a phenomenon later understood as high frequency electromagnetic waves, effectively radio. Um, Edison believed it was the mysterious force that's that pervaded the ether. What was the ether? Can't quite, is that like the? It was a theory for space not being empty. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the space but, containing matter or? Yeah, essentially. Or unseeable jello or yeah, something so like that. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. So with his etheroscope, he was actually able to detect and measure or at least see what was going on. So that's the primitive version you can get, you know, high tech ones. I, a quick search for a theroscope and you'll, <clears throat> you'll pop up a whole lot of high tech gadgets that. You should argue Maxwell's last week. He's the guy that disproved this. Oh, Maxwell disproved that? Yeah. Huh, interesting. Let's see. Well, what about, so what do you think about, well, think about Marconi for, and I don't talk, you know, I don't, I think I have a little blurb about Marconi, um, but, you know. Oh, I should ask, though, how, how did Maxwell disprove that? Well, by showing the speed of light was the same in every direction, so it meant that we could, if the Earth would have, the Earth would have to be the same as the point of reference, so. You know, you'd expect as we're traveling through the ether that, that the speed of light in one direction is different than the other uh -huh. by the by the amount we're moving through it. Yeah, because well, we're not static. 
Yeah, but the maximum mm -hmm. ultra, the speed of light is the same in every direction, so we can't be moving through the ether and it can't be a, thick, a thing, a medium. Oh, okay. Then what was his alternative to that? I don't think he had one. I think, I think photons and everything was just like yeah. the later theories. So he would have had, so somebody would have had to come up and follow with Maxwell's theory of, his anti-theory of Edison's theory. So maybe we'll find that. Um, I never came, I didn't come across that, but um, I'll look for that. That's, uh, we'll jump back into peer review. You know, Edison, Maxwell, peer review right there. So, um, Hughes, and I'm not sure if, if he's actually the forefather of Hughes.net, you know, the satellite internet company. But uh, 1878, uh, David Hughes noticed that sparks could be heard in a telephone receiver uh, with uh, when experimenting with his carbon microphone. Um, it's just a little tiny observation that somehow became notable through history because he built on that observation. He, in, in, he invented the uh, induction, uh, the induction balance later used in metal detectors, and in 1879 he transmitted and received radio waves using a detector made of carbon years before Heinrich Hertz and 16 years before Marconi demonstrated wireless uh, tele telegraphy. Um, and you can't really say enough about Tesla and how much his experiments had to do with what we've got these days. I mean, a lot of the things that he dreamed of we we see I mean one thing that we don't have um, if you've ever watched documentaries about Tesla you know he kind of envisioned electric cars but being powered wirelessly through a big giant transmitter array um, like that thing that big giant tower right there that's scary the government was scared of that the government wanted to it, if you compare the documentaries the government wanted to you know, use that for the death ray. <laughs> and that's why we don't have that today because he scrapped all of his plans for that and nobody can find him. Um, uh, Tesla did a great many things before Marconi invented the radio. And that's debatable whether or not Marconi actually invented the radio or whether Tesla did, but Marconi made it happen because he had more connections. Um, Tesla's life was, he was embattled. <laughs> um, and his peer review never could see him through to the end of a lot of his experiments, so. Let's see. I lost my clicker. Heinrich Rudolf Hertz. In a series of brilliant experiments, Hertz discovered radio waves and established that uh, James Clerk Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism is correct. Uh, Hertz also discovered the photoelectric effect, providing one of the first clues to the existence of the quantum world. The unit of frequency the Hertz is named in his honor. And and I'm not sure what his relationship was with Maxwell and Edison and all that. I'm sure they built off of each other or disproved and added on or whatever. One of the guys that really goes unmentioned, um, some people say that, that Bose was the father of modern day wireless technology. Um, he did an experiment. <laughs> where he wires, wirelessly lit a fuse and it rang, you know, had a little explosion and rang a bell. Um, he did, he performed what they call cutting edge research on electromagnetic radiation in 1895. He demonstrated for the first time the wireless transmission and reception of microwave signals. 
before Marconi's more celebrated 1897 demonstration of wireless uh, tele um, telegraphy across the UK's Salisbury Plain, Bose did his experiment. At a public demonstration in Calcutta Town Hall in November of 1895, Bose sent an electromagnetic wave 75 feet passing through walls to remotely ring a bell and to explode some gunpowder. He also invented the mercury, um, I think it's co coherer or something like that, a radio wave receiver that was um, later used by Marconi to build the first operational transatlantic two-way radio capable of communicating across 2,000 miles. Um, Marconi's significant because he built upon the research of past uh, pioneers and which is what we're doing these days. I say we, but we as mankind, we're building off all the foundational um, pioneers of technology. And this is just one aspect of what science of telecommunications is based upon all these guys from the 1600s on. So, otherwise we would still be using semaphore flags and um, smoke signals and uh, doves or pigeons. Um, So when you think about all those guys from the past, and there was, um, I didn't actually talk about the women involved in creating a lot of the things that we have today too. Um, maybe it's just because I'm a guy and I was just looking for guys. But as I was doing research, also there was a lot of women involved in, in making history to where we are now. Um, So my questions, everything we see and use today is based upon the break, breakthroughs from these men and many others I didn't mention. Have we taken these ideas to their limits yet? I mean, some people would say, I mean, if you look up what's the, what's in 2018, what was the groundbreaking technology that hit the headlines? Does anybody see anything? What about in the past 10 years? Have we had any groundbreaking technology or technological breakthroughs in science? Or How about the Galaxy Fold? Did they just decided not to do anymore. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Is that, would that be a breakthrough or, I mean, it's cool. Yes. Everybody wants one. <laughs> Well, I think it's cool because it, it, it looks like a phone, but it's also like, it's like a little tablet as well. Yeah. Oh, the folding one? Yeah, the folding one. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like a tablet when you open it up, and then you close it, and it's a phone. Yeah. So you don't have to carry both. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. What other ones did we see that were in the last 10 years that were amazing breakthroughs? What about quantum computing? That might be over 10 years, though. I think they're still they're still playing around with that though. They are they're still around. I was talking to a guy who's working on getting AWS to use it. So oh really? Machines that oh okay. Now, Google was trying to work on their quantum computer still too, or did they table that? I, I don't know. How uh, about uh, um, things like automatic translators where your phone can just translate speech from one language to another? Yeah, that would be cool. I, you can do that now, right? Yeah, and you can, I know that you can do it, like if you're in a, um, yeah, like if you're in Facebook and somebody writes in Spanish, you can say translate this, and it does a pretty good job. Self-driving cars? Self-driving cars? That's pretty cool. And that no computer vision? Computer vision? As in, as in the ability to take a series of photos and discern uh, the locations and uh, descriptions of different objects. Oh, right. What kind of what kind of muscle behind that is required? I mean, what kind of like? I don't know, but they use it for that. Yeah. 
self self driving cars. Well, that sure is pretty cool. The uh, tech is more than ten years old or not, but finally it's coming being you know, available commercially. Some new non flash, you know, non volatile memory that doesn't have all flash disadvantages. You know, there's Intel's opting, and there's like HP is working on something too. Cool. Um, Something just crossed my mind. There was a, I was reading an article today that was written by Bill Gates and was talking about like the top ten things and what the, what he's actually seeing is, um, they're actually MIT and some other ones are actually looking for people just like us to invent a new alternative fuel. <laughs> it hasn't been invented yet. And, and we, we can burn all the soybean oil that we want to, but something that actually jumps the gap into something new that we've never seen before, that's what they're looking for, something that will carry us on into the future. Um, we're into outer space. They want to, uh, they want to go to Mars. You can't really realistically go to Mars on fossil fuels, right? So, so they're looking for a breakthrough. Along, along those lines. One of the other things that I saw <laughs> along with the computer and the self-driving cars and the AI is um, robots, um, robot dexterity. So they want to develop robots that actually have, you know, human-like dexterity in their fingers. And I don't know how many lines of code it's gonna take to actually write all that stuff and make it work with, without it, you know, you know, so much trial and error, so much money, but, um, yeah. Is there any, any other cool things that you see? I, I hate, I, I, I don't like to be a pessimist because I, I think that we've kind of reached kind of like the pinnacle of all the old school research and somehow we're moving down this track and we got to jump to that next track somehow and I'm, hoping and praying that somebody starts and just jumps track and jumps with new ideas. You can't, you can't throw away all the science though, can you? you? Have to, everything's linked. It doesn't matter if we jump the rails and jump to a new rail and start making our own path. Everything seems to be linked. Even, even I think Marconi wasn't quite the scientist that he goes down in the history as, but what he was, so he was somebody who took and built off of things that went before him, and then he was able to make it, uh, put the wheels and rubber to the road and make it, make it actually happen. He's the one who actually made the um, radio transmission over, over the Atlantic happen. Um, yeah. Materials that were supposed to be close to room temperature, which was supposed to make huge advances in computing, but ain't there yet. Yeah, we used to hear about it. Well, at least I used to hear about it quite a bit, and then it's like, oh, this failed, this failed, this failed, this failed, this failed. Never mind. What was the most efficient? Was it gold? Well, no. Uh, it's it's an order of magnitude higher. If you get things down you know, really cold, like liquid hydrogen cold, mm -hmm. um, then they, the conductivity is basically, I mean the resistance, sorry, not conductivity, is basically zero. Um, it's literally zero. Yeah. That's the whole point of Oh, because it, it condenses and all the molecules get closer because there's no gaps to jump I for them. it's more the molecules don't bounce around and get in the way of things. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so. They were looking, they're like, well, if we can raise the temperature up to something reasonable. Yeah. And, uh, we're getting closer. I, yeah. So if, if that ever happened, that would be a break in technology. But I'm like, at this point, I'm like, eh, right. <laughs> I'll believe it when I see it. I mean, a lot of the material science that's making things possible is like getting away from metals, like, you know, all the carbon based things, so that those planes can go twice as far on the fuel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even like all the new spaceships and all the material science is getting in there. 
Yeah. Yeah, I know. So I, I work at Boeing, and I work on the triple seven X, and I work in the composite wings, yeah. and it's amazing new product. It's it's amazing. And if you've ever flown on a carbon fiber airplane, they're just amazing, amazing to to fly in. So the so there are new technologies. I think that still, I mean, Boeing wasn't the first one to work with carbon fiber. But it's yeah, yeah, but some of the 1960s airplanes had carbon fiber in them, so it's not new technology. It's something that we figured out how to uh, efficient, efficiently manufacture. So, what's that? It's pretty much just really tough fiberglass. No, it's uh, it's actually um, it's not fiberglass. It's uh, what well, no, it's not glass, obviously. No, it's, it's the same uh, principle. It's like a hybrid carbon glass mixture and it's pretty pretty strong pretty strong I'm I don't know all the science behind it I just know that we 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 have things that are just carbon fiber and we have things that are just fiberglass composites and they work differently and they heat up differently and but they've been still they've been using them since um, I think the 60s some of those airplanes in the past had carbon fiber Yes, yeah, quite a bit. Because the technology has, I think, there's another thing is that, so we, we had all these um, grand ideas in the way, way past, but we didn't have the technology to build the hardware to make all those great ideas work. Now, we're getting the technology to build all the cool hardware to make all that stuff work. Like, uh, our processors are smaller and more powerful, and um, I think I got the latest and greatest processor in uh, this Christmas for my new computer build, well, it was great when I bought it. <laughs> but a couple months later, somebody, you know, they, they've improved it quite a bit. So, um, you know, we continue to build on the science of the past and looking towards the future. And if you look at our, uh, the, the, the concept of fiber optics, has been around for a long time. You know, we've just now gotten uh, brave enough to set up fiber optics everywhere. So, because we have the technology and it's more cost, it's more cost effective now than it used to be. Um, the new airplanes have carbon fire, uh, carbon fiber everywhere, everywhere on these new airplanes, and we have to have special training on how to handle it and stuff like that, but. I've heard that with carbon fiber um, in applications where it's very strenuous, there can be uh, an issue with not being able to tell when the carbon fiber has been damaged because it can have such like hairline fractures or it, it doesn't break until it fully breaks. Yeah. So do you know? Yeah, so they have a thing, um, a cool tool that they can... So I don't know about the long stretches of carbon fiber, how they do that, but the short stretches of carbon fiber, they have a, um, uh, what, what would you call it? It's a really, really tiny um, bore scope that will go actually go through the, through the tubes and actually be able to see inside the, the fiber optic lines. Don't the fractures reduce the efficiency of the Yeah. I know speed for some something and uh, uh, one that you're suspicious of. Yeah, so I'm I, I'm I'm on the mechanical end of things, so the electricians usually handle all that stuff, but I, I just know that if I brush up against carbon fiber and I can and if it's broken I know that it actually busts through the case. So the what what we use is um, the the case is kind of permeable, so it doesn't contain the glass when it's broken. So, uh, and that can be really nasty because you can get you can get um, you know, that stuff in your hands. And so, just to kind of summarize, all the old ideas in 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 the past are being built on even today. Um, it's fun to go back and look into history and 
all this stuff you can find on Google. Um, uh, it's, it's in college textbooks as well. Uh, it's not in your everyday high school classrooms. Um, what would you find it on Google? What would you search for? Oh, um, I just, what I started to do was um, the, so most of everything that we talked about here was basically telecommunication based. And so you go and you do history of telecommunications and it starts popping off notable names. Um, and then you go in and you look for the specific um, individual names, um, Maxwell, Hertz, Marconi. This isn't all of them, but this is a good deal of them. The ones that were um, mostly computer based were the guys who actually designed the calculators and like Pascal and what was the other guy's name? Was it Kleist? I don't remember. Paul Schickard and Pascal built the calculators. Those guys were computer based. I thought that was intriguing. Um, but we continue to build on those things in the past. So flash forward to the future, what ideas are, are coming up that people are going to be building? What's, what is actually going to take us to Mars? So do you think we can ever have true AI without developing a trinary computer system? I don't know. I, do, I know that. That's the third choice. Yeah, you can say yes or no, but you can't say I don't know. You yeah. can't say maybe. Yeah, you put zeros and ones, you put two zeros and ones together, and then you can do zero, one, or two, or three. You can, and then it's ignore the fourth one, or you don't do it up at all, and it's comparable. Yes, but maybe the first zero and the first one are incorrect. Maybe they should have been threes. Well, that's where it comes down to is who starts the program because AI takes over after that, writes their own language. But if the answer always has to be yes or no, and it can never be maybe or I don't know, how do you get true AI? Well, what do you mean by true AI? Because, like, what if, what if something is posed as a question? Are you trying to like obtain sentience with AI, or you just want it to be general purpose AI? Because um, you can do general purpose AI. I think sentience. If something's posed as a question, whether it's philosophical or engineering, and the facts don't currently exist out there, um, but there has to be an answer, either yes or no. Let me give it. If we can't figure out if people are sentient, how are we going to figure out if robots are sentient? Exactly. Well, we can say people, maybe. The bigger maybe issue is whether know. it's yes or no. It's whether what's the probability of being yes versus the probability of being yeah. no. Again, any kind of a sweet number is easily you know, done with binary. I think maybe a better question would be what we can now look for. I mean, an infinite number. But, would, but wouldn't true yeah, AI but include maybe? Because a true AI would never say yes or no. A true AI would be reasoning and a coming, coming to a conclusion through maybe let's look into this more. You know, so if we just give AI the ultimatum and you can either be yes or you either be no, then I don't think that's true AI. And it wouldn't be true what you would call sentient. No, but if you use percentage, say 80-20, and the AI picks 80, what if it's a long shot and the 20 comes in? Maybe the AI well, I mean, you could, could, have said, too. could have said maybe. The AI couldn't say maybe. Yeah, I don't think anyone would say you can make an infallible AI, but you know, you can make one as good as a person, um, probably. And I think a lot of the mathematics, but a lot of these systems, they're all equivalent in some sense. Yeah. So what's interesting about the AI discussion that I've observed is that aren't they supposed to get to a point to where they start writing their own stuff? They start writing their own code and then they have to have some sort of a brain or a server to back them up so all that stuff is stored well, so actually, they can remember have it. Have you all. seen the, the programs that write their own poems? Those are, could be actually pretty hilarious. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's obviously a very rough start to AI, but in some regards, it would be considered AI. But, yeah. But I think a lot of people theorize things are going to change big time when, when 
when AIs get to a certain level, because when they can write their own programs, yeah, you know, then they're doing something that we can't, because we can't reprogram our brain. Yeah. That they expect, you know, that's what they call the singularity, where it's just going to explode. Yeah. Like their intelligence will just grow exponentially. You know? Yeah. Is it I mean, once their intelligence is guiding it, as opposed to more of the sort of trial and error approaches we use now. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I just, so we have robots in manufacturing, and the new robots are supposed to communicate to each other. So if one's working here, one's working on the outside, and they're both supposed to be working kind of on the same job, but different aspects of the job, but they're supposed to be working or together. <clears throat> they're supposed to talk to each other and they're supposed to communicate to each other but I don't think we're there yet because we still don't have storage capability to really support that now the automotive industry has been doing amazing with robots <coughs> and stuff but they're not AI yet um, the automatic vehicles that drive around, they're not quite AI. The other thing is, like on a lot of those science ones that you have for mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of things like the big gliders, like they've got CERN in Switzerland, a lot of that just sort of proved, you know, like a lot of that was, you know, discovering electromagnetism <coughs> and then discovering the next thing and the next thing. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of that is, like from the CERN reactor, we sort of proved that in, you know, the amount of power we have, Mm -hmm. Are they still running that? Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's done today, but they still run the series of experiments. Okay. And they're at the sort of power level now where they sort of prove that there's no new like field of like electromagnetism yeah. within reach of you know what we could ever produce here. Yeah. I wonder if we've actually tapped into so the Tesla's theory of static electricity coming from the Earth and all that. I mean that's pretty much been proven but I don't know have we actually utilized that energy I mean they were afraid of it back in his day problem is you need different potentials yeah, yeah. No. yeah. well I mean you do but by the time, point where it actually matters you've got something 800 miles across and you're pulling like a wad off of it yeah it's just it's like, like if it ends up uncontrollable like lightning it's you know more about or you know can you practically do it yeah, yeah. the atmosphere does more than the difference magnetic field yeah. yeah. ever do yeah, because you start messing around with that stuff and you have to deal with the reactions that come from that. So well, We've used it effectively to form our little sisters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, all right. I, I think, I, I think I'm pretty much, pretty much in. I just, uh, I just did this just to kind of spark thinking, you know, and this is extremely limited and benign based upon my own you know, observations, but take it for what you want. Um, I always told my kids to follow your dreams, and I actually had to apologize to one of my kids because he said, I've chosen this path. And I said, you what? And, and a week later, I had to, I wrote him a letter, said, I apologize. I told you to follow your dreams. I went, first test of that, I failed you. So I keep this letter for the rest of your life in case I do it again. And, um, but, you know, as we raise our, our kids, tell them to follow their dreams, give them everything they need to experiment with and to play with and um, wh whatever it takes to get us to that next level of scientific breakthroughs. So that's it. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it.